34-year-old man shot dead by city constabulary rank after escaping from the lockups. Woman injured in Leopold Street drive by shooting. Revised parking meter contract approved by City Hall. And Parliament still to approve the severance pay for sugar workers. Those were the top headlines for the week ending January 21. I'm Ashley Scotland. Good afternoon. Starting things off on MTV News Update's Week in Review, we tell you that a mentally ill man was shot dead by a Lance Corporal attached to the city constabulary on Saturday. The now deceased man was arrested on Saturday and was seen in a video being brutalized by an individual after being subdued by a city constable. More from Nikhil Jordan. That is 34 year old Marlon Fredericks of Tiger Bay, who was fatally wounded on Sunday afternoon. The man met his demise just outside of the city constabulary outpost at Regent and Border Streets. The police in a statement said the deceased was the same man who on Saturday was involved in an incident with a rank of the city constabulary. Initial investigation has revealed that the deceased was in custody at the outpost for assaulting a peace officer and for a simple larceny. The police added that the deceased forced his way out of the lockups after the door was opened to let another individual out to use the washroom. A struggle reportedly ensued between the deceased and the Lance Corporal, who was armed with a service pistol. Federicks eventually darted out of the compound and was fatally shot in his lower back. After being shot, he slumped against a wall a couple feet away from the constabulary's entrance. An eyewitness believes that the force meted out to the deceased was on call for, since the man did not pose a danger to anyone. The eyewitness said she also saw what transpired the day before when the deceased was apprehended by the ranks attached to the city constabulary. You see all you are when you get bad? When you get bad now and you see you get bad, why you, you have to do it here? It should start from down there. Why the police got bad when you have... It got started from down there with the day and then you shoot. You shoot in the yard and that whole party when you sit down. That is wrong. But I say he escaped, did he escape? But yeah, if, if he escaped, he got a button in his hand, shoot him on his foot. Once I run away from you, you priorities to shoot me on my foot. I was a GBS. He was, he was in range that you could have hold him out to. Or you lash me with a button or you shy something on me. I would have fall. Why is it I meet till E? Then you shoot me till E. Come the distance away. But now you say come the distance away from what you see. I'll come to a party man and all he will say now. Before he lies down. The last corporal who shot Fredericks has been arrested. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Minister of Natural Resources Raphael Trotman claims that a clause in the petroleum agreement is a matter of concern. The clause, which says that the minister must inform ExxonMobil seven days before going to observe its operations. While the minister claims it is a matter of concern, he is the said person that signed a revised contract in June last year. Find out more in this Roshana Gomes Canelius report. According to the Minister of Natural Resources, Raphael Trotman, Guyanese should be more exhilarated with the country's imminent oil and gas sector, particularly as it relates to the vast spectrum of interest being shown by both regional and international business personnel and corporations. Uh, so this is the vision I see. This is the vision that I will be, uh, continue to take to the people of Guyana, that you are going to be rich, that billions of U.S. dollars are coming our way that we have entered into an agreement with a company which has decided to take the risks because prior to the discovery in 2015 we had made several attempts to make discoveries and all failed and each attempt um, cost hundreds of millions of dollars this is a company that is prepared to stand up in the face of the threats against the opposition that is coming towards production that is willing to partner with us that is willing to train Guyanese that is willing to invest in our environmental program that is willing to invest in working with us as an equal partner. We get 50% of all that is out there. Of course, there's cost recovery, and it is our job to keep the cost at a minimum, minimum as is the job of every other 
um, revenue service in any part of the world. Though Minister Trotman praised the long-standing efforts and work of ExxonMobil, he noted that certain provisions will be put in place to ensure that the government takes every opportunity to adequately oversee and scrutinize the work done by ExxonMobil as it relates to the amount of oil being extracted. Again, this is a natural concern. Uh, <clears throat> there is a 24-hour presence even now uh, on board uh, every vessel by GGMC officers and the intention is that by production we will have both GRA and uh, petroleum engineers on board. So we have anticipated that. It, Ghana again is not unique. There are uh, methods of um, having real-time assessments of production, calibrating production. It's like a gas pump so you know how much is produced and shipped off. So that is um, in the process of being put in place and I, I can assure you that um, yes it is a natural and, and genuine fear to have and it is something that we are assessing. As regard the amount of oil blocks being allocated to the oil company by the government of Guyana, Minister Trotman clearly outlined that it is from the 1999 agreement devised between the previous administration and ExxonMobil, which the government is currently working with. He also affirmed that there are no inclinations to stray away from the confines of that agreement. I, I don't want to, to, to say two or seven except to say that the exact acreage that Exxon had in the 1999 agreement is what they maintained in the 2016 agreement. Uh, so there's really one standard block known as the Stabro block. But as I said, we gave the exact figure that they had in 1999. We did not take away any or add any not to that. It is the same figure that um, <clears throat> Mrs. Jagan gave in 99 that we kept in place in 2000. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. Leader of the Alliance for Change, Rafael Trotman, says that the party will be looking to find leaders, both locally and internationally, to run for the local government elections scheduled for November 2018. Here again is Yanis Abrams. It was announced that the two main focuses for the Alliance for Change in 2018 is constitutional reform along with the upcoming local government elections. Leader of the party, Raphael Trotman, said that the AFC will be running as an independent party in the local government elections in November. Trotman mentioned that the party will be assessing leaders in and out of Guyana for the elections. Our preparations, as is the case with all elections, uh, the General Secretary will headline much of this. Organization is critical, and this is why we are staying in touch with our groups, going back down on the ground, identifying candidates, uh, getting a sense of the issues, and uh, of course, uh, raising money. Uh, that is the milk of every campaign, uh, financing. And so, those are the critical areas for the campaign. The leader made mention of the Cummings Burke Accord still scheduled to be reviewed before February 14. He further mentioned that the agreement has areas for improvement and it has kept the coalition in government. We have, however, sought to canvas some other views uh, before we settle down. We have, in fact, identified a team that will represent us in, in upcoming talks. There will be talks because, as I said, the accord has a lifespan of a minimum of three years, a maximum of five, and was geared primarily towards national elections and was very silent on local government elections. So uh, in anticipation of that, we, we sought and are seeking to canvas some more views, both from within the party and outside of the party, because we do have friends and critics uh, on the outside um, whose views we wish to, to get. The Cummingsburg Accord was signed to unite the Partnership for National Unity and the Alliance for Change to contest in the 2015 national and regional elections. This accord has allowed the coalition to be victorious. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. Now on the police's blotter. A mother is claiming that the police, after arresting her son, brutalized him. She's seeking justice as her son was only taken to the hospital on Tuesday, despite the beating allegedly occurred on Saturday. More from Nikhil Jondo. 
A 21-year-old soldier is now receiving medical attention at the Georgetown Public Hospital after he was allegedly beaten by police, according to his mother, Denise Hillman. Jamal Hazel of Airfield Sophia was on duty at base camp Stevenson to Mary when a party of policemen came and arrested him on Saturday, January 13. The young man's mother, during an interview with News Update, claimed that the ranks, after arresting her son, took him to a dump site along the east bank of Damarara. Detailing what her son told her, Hillman claimed that the ranks forced him to admit to a wrongdoing to which he had no knowledge. Hillman is claiming that the police accused her son of hiding an illegal gun in a yard at Trench Road La Penitens. That accusation, she claimed, has been mounted by a woman whom he shares a relationship with. The mother said the police had questioned the woman. However, she was released. The woman added that after the beating, they took him to the Prashad Nagar police outpost. During his time at the lockups, Hillman claimed that the officer in charge denied her son medical attention despite he was crying out for abdominal pains. This morning, I, I went to see my son after I launched Prashad Nagar police station. And when I questioned my son, my son told me again that he was being beaten. Hillman further claimed that on Monday, when she visited her son at the outpost, he was taken to the Bergdam station for an identification parade. After that, the young man was taken back to the outpost at Prashad Nagar. This morning when Hillman returned, her son was not taken for medical attention. However, when this newscast visited the police outpost, the officer in charge informed us that Hazel was on his way to the Georgetown Public Hospital. At the medical institution, Hazel was seen slumped in a wheelchair. And I need justice! I need justice! Police don't have no right for their beating nobody, children, when they arrest them. Do a fair investigation or not fair or whatever they want to put it down. I put the chair before the court, let the magistrates them make a final decision. Not for the police beating you, turn into fear. I got them admitting things with the show not admit to. I then got them in pain. I actually miss me son look like he not even make it how I see them. I have a call for my son just now, Jamal, Jamal. Don't give up. I don't like when my son going through there. I don't like it. The president of this country, the Home Affairs Minister, and all relevant authority, they need to look into this police brutality. Meanwhile, when contacted for a comment, Commander of A Division Marlon Chapman claimed that the police did not arrest the soldier from Timeri. Rather, it was ranks of the GDF who brought him and handed him over to the police. Further, the commander affirmed such allegations. Only recently, a law enforcement officer was seen mercilessly kicking a vendor to his head after he was apprehended. The vendor was eventually shot and killed the next day by a rank of the city constabulary after he tried to escape. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. In response to the fatal shooting of 34-year-old Marlon Fredericks of Tiger Bay, Georgetown, by a city police officer, social activist Jonathan Yearwood describes the killing as inhumane. Find out more in this Lashana Gomes Canelius report. According to Yearwood, while the entire incident is quite disturbing, the arrested corporal who is accused of firing a deadly shot should have taken other means to apprehend the now deceased man. Yearwood argued that no regard was shown towards other members of the public when the fatal shot was fired. Regarding adequate and professional training of all city police officers, Yearwood is petitioning for those officers to be retrained. I think it's an incident that should never have happened and I think that the blame lies on a lack of proper training for the city constabulary. I would like to suggest that the senior management of the city constabulary have a very serious look at retraining their junior officers on how to conduct themselves for incidences like this. Why is it that their first choice is to go for a weapon? 
are they not physically fit to run behind someone in a crowded area why would you want to draw a weapon and fire a weapon you can hit anyone it's it's a it's a very disturbing thought that this actually took place in the thing and it's not the first incident we've had an incident recently where a woman was shot in the buttocks by a policeman doing exactly the same thing shooting into a crowded area we need to retrain our our security services to learn how to behave in a proper manner in these circumstances further Yearwood will be pressing the matter so that it does not go unpunished or without the public being aware of the actions being taken. Well, I would, I would like to think that a very serious investigation, a very thorough investigation is carried out. And let the chips fall where they may. If the officer is guilty of dereliction of duty, he should be disciplined for it. He certainly needs retraining. Because the mere fact that you would pull a loaded, you would fire a weapon off in public tells me that you need to be retrained. Against an unarmed man, yes, you do need to be retrained. I am hoping that there will be a, an unbiased investigation. And whatever the results may come out of that, let the chips fall where they may. According to initial reports, the deceased Marlon Fredericks on Saturday, January 13, was taken into the custody of the city constabulary for matters pertaining to simple larceny and assaulting of a peace officer. The reports revealed that Fredericks, in several physical attempts to escape from the lockups, finally did so when a door was opened to allow another prisoner usage to the laboratory. It was further revealed that Fredericks, after running a short distance away from the border city constabulary, was fatally shot in the lower back by a city constable who had been pursuing him. In the aftermath of the chain of events, video imagery of a badly beaten Fredericks was shown about on social media, leaving many to wonder what a face of justice is. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. After almost two years since the Kitty Market Rehabilitation Project commenced, Tom Clark Royston King now announced that it will be completed in March 2018. City Hall will be using $50 million from the $200 million they received from central government. Yanis Abrams filed this report. Tom Clark Royston King related to news update yesterday that Minister of Communities Ronald Bilkin signed a contract of over $25 million to a contractor, BML Architects and Engineers, to complete the first phase of the Kitty Market project. This comes on the heel of a protest which took place at Kitty Market on January 13. Opposition member Juan Edgel, who led the protest, claimed that the project is poorly managed and the vendors are being treated poorly. What is surprising is that this facility, when this new administration took office, this facility was near collapse. It was in an advanced stage of deterioration and it was in a ruinous condition, a danger to life and limb. And nothing was done by a previous administration. But under this new administration, we have started to do restorative works with our own resources but because of resource constraints, we've had some delays in reaching the timelines. On February 4, 2016, the Mayor and City Council started a project to reconstruct the dilapidated Kitty Market for Guyana's 50th Independence Anniversary. It was scheduled to be completed in May, but according to Tom Clark, enough finances caused the delay. It is now a few days shy of two years since the project started, yet City Hall is yet to complete it. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. It is now over three weeks now since a Sophia vendor was allegedly raped by two on-duty police officers attached to the Turkine police station. Though the police force has already conducted their initial investigation into the matter, legal advice is yet to be given. Lashana Gomes-Canelius with the details. 
According to Commander of Sea Division Calvin Brutus, regarding the alleged rape of a Sophia vendor on New Year's Eve, the police are still awaiting legal advice from the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution on the legal steps to take in the matter. Two police officers are accused of the heinous crime. As for them, Commander Brutus related they have both been transferred to the Tactical Services Unit TSU, where they remain under close arrest. Investigation completed, you know, we just waiting on advice. We sent it down for advice. I can't say if it's a DPP or the legal advice, but we sent it down for advice. According to initial reports on New Year's Eve, a Sophia closed vendor went to the Turkine police station to make a report after an individual threw scripts at her. After the woman related the incident to the police officer on duty at the station, she inquired to use the toilet. The woman was allegedly then directed by another male officer to a washroom on the upper flat of the said building. It was mere moments after using the toilet that the woman claimed two male police officers accosted and vised her before they sexually assaulted her. After the horrifying ordeal, the woman went and reported what was done to her by the two officers, but claimed the commanding police corporal on duty dismissed her claims. According to Commander Brutus, the alleged victim in the matter is cooperating with police. In a previous newscast, Commander Brutus vehemently condemned all illegal and unprofessional acts carried out by officers of the force. The commander had noted that the strictest of the law applies to all persons in society and no member of the force is exempted from such. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. Two persons have been arrested in South Rheinfeld following a drive-by shooting in Leopold Street that left a woman nursing multiple gunshot wounds. More from Nikhil Jandu. A resident of Leopold Street was shot multiple times about her body this morning. The woman, 55-year-old Jacqueline Ladner, sustained gunshot wounds to her body during a drive-by shooting. Reports from persons in the area have indicated that the occupants of a motor car opened fire on a shop. It is reported that the woman was in the shop at the time of the drive-by shooting. The woman was immediately rushed to the Joshua Public Hospital, where she remains in a stable condition. However, the persons suspected to have carried out the inhumane act did not escape scotch-free. Based on information given to the police, ranks swooped down on a house at Penny Lane, South Rumfeld, and arrested two individuals. Their identities remain unknown, as police are hunting for the alleged gunmen. The motive for the drive-by shooting is unclear. Investigators have been questioning persons in the area to ascertain what may have led to the shooting. Several spent shells were retrieved from the crime scene by investigators. Nikhil Jondo reporting for MTV News Update. Former President Donald Ramatar is urging the coalition government to retain the scrap metal industry and quickly reopen the trade. His statement comes after the Guyana Metal Recyclers Association speculated that the government intends to keep it closed. Godfrey Brooms filed this report. The scrap metal trade was closed on June 15, 2015 to accommodate the forensic audit which was completed by December 2015. It remained closed pending an assessment and a strengthening of systems and introduction of new legislations. The trade was scheduled to be reopened by November 2016, according to the Minister of Business, Dominic Gaskin. However, this did not happen. The trade was subsequently reopened in 2017, only for a period of three months for the stockpiles of scrap metal in the city to be exported. The Ghana Metal Recyclers Association is now wondering if the government's motive is to close the trade permanently. It is against this backdrop that former President Donna Ramutar made it clear that the trade should never be closed as it brings in much needed income to sustain many families. However, Ramutar did highlight that whilst the trade was operable, the theft of metal was also prevalent. 
This, he affirmed, the government must put measures in place to control. We control because we know that that trade was also um, part of the problem that trade created was stealing of, of telephone wires, transformers and GPL and so on and so forth. They've, but I don't think because of that problem you should shut the whole trade completely. You've got to put measures in place to prevent those things from happening and allow the legitimate people to, um, to, to export scrap metal. It's, a, it's still a good business. Godfrey Brooms, MTV News Update. On a positive note, the work of lawyers is continually being appreciated by President David Granger as four of them were on Thursday sworn in as senior counsels. Yanis Abrams followed this report. President David Granger appointed four senior counsels at State House today. During his address to legal professionals, the president congratulated the attorneys for receiving instrument of commission appointing them as senior counsels. This title gives them pride and prestige within Guyana's legal profession. For their erudition, their experience, their eminence, and their excellence, the title is a symbol, a social symbol, representing the values of duty and integrity and the standards of social responsibility and respect for the law. The award of the honor of senior counsel recognizes those whose service in the legal profession has evinced those values and standards. Such service is worthy of emulation. Such service can encourage juniors in the profession to strive for the highest standards. President Granger further said he feels duty bound to recognize those who have served with distinction. Those appointed are Khaled Yuma Yassin, Fitz Leroy Peters, Andrew Fitzgerald Powell, and Josephine Whitehead. Under this government, nine councils have been appointed in 2017. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. An Airfield Sapphire resident is asking for some attention to be given to the community since a particular road, which was the first link from Airfield to Bfield, has been in a deplorable state for years. That road has been described as a swimming pool by some residents. Find out more in this Yanis Abrams report. Residents of Airfield Sapphire are pleading with the relevant authorities to look into the issue of the multiple potholes through the first constructed access road which links A-Field to B-Field Sophia. Odessa Primus mentioned that, for the past six years, the road has transformed from bad to worse. Primus noted that they had written to community leaders about the issue but stopped since they had noticed roads were being capped. And the sad thing is that um, the road right out here was um, done after the new government took office. But this cross street, which is the only cross street um, that existed before that can take you from A straight into B field, the other two were done, um, well created actually because they didn't have those two before. And this one was more or less neglected. The guys came, they graded the street and that was about it. Like nothing else was done. I mean, we had a case where um, an ambulance had to come to pick up somebody here um, and it drove around the other side and then they had to get the person and bring them out because it, the, the vehicle, the ambulance couldn't drive in. I mean, this is a sad situation. You have taxis, these guys don't want to come through the street. They put you off at the corner and you have to walk with your bags, walk with your kids if you're not well, if you're pregnant, you're basically on your own. During the interview with the woman, she stated the difficulty persons face, especially in emergency situations. Um, needs urgent attention. This is the first cross street. This is a main street. And um, sadly, it, it is um, being neglected or I, I don't know, like I have spoken about it. I have posted about it on, on social media. Um, I noticed Quasi Ace is also talking about it because he's living um, right up the street. So this is, it's a disaster. Everybody is complaining, but at this point. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. The government has moved to the National Assembly, seeking half of the $4 billion to pay sugar workers of their severance. Nikhil John who followed this report. Minister of Finance Winston Jordan has submitted a supplementary provision to the National Assembly 
asking for the approval of $1 billion. $750 million. That amount is to meet part of the severance payment that is due to Gaisuka workers. The supplementary paper states that the estimated cost of the severance is $4.24 billion. It noted that 50% will be paid by the end of January 2018 and the balance before the end of 2018. Supplementary estimate current totaling $1 billion. $750 million for the period 2018-01-01 to 2018-12-31. And I name January 19th as the date for consideration of this period. A point to note is that a total of $2.25 billion will be paid out at the end of January 2018. The government announced plans to close three sugar estates in 2018. That means thousands of workers will be out of jobs and will have to seek alternative employment. However, the coalition administration has been providing skills training to the affected employees through Gaisuku. That will enable the workers to acquire additional skills to seek employment. Meanwhile, the Ghana Agricultural and General Workers Union GAU is totally against the 50% payout to the workers. The union believes that the government should make a complete payment to the workers. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Touching on the sugar industry, the Ghana Agricultural and General Workers Union is unwavering in their stance to safeguard the livelihoods of sugar workers. At a regional conference, the president of the union told attendees of the devastating effects the closure of the sugar industry has on the thousands of persons. Rashawn Gomes Cornelius filed with this report. President of the Guiana Agricultural and General Workers Union, Kamal Chand, while praising the work of the International Union of Food, Agriculture, Hotel, Restaurant, Catering, Tobacco and Allied Workers Association, both in the region and the rest of the world, indicated that the sugar industry, which plays a crucial role in Guyanese society, is now basically leaving many families on the breadline. There has been a lot of... Um, debate in the country about the government policy to sugar because of the importance of sugar in Guyana to the economy it ha it, it's related to everybody not not only sugar bring us to Guyana the two major races the Indians and the Africans but it plays an important role in the economy and so we have been able our union had been able to move this issue from a Gau Gaisuko sugar worker issue to a national issue. So the government had been forced to look back at its decision. I know it's difficult for you to go back on your decision, but it's forced to look back and to see how they could alleviate the hardship. And that we are pressing them to do. General Secretary of the IUF, Susan Longley, during her brief remarks, touched on the significance of the IUF in ensuring that workers' rights towards job security and safety within various sectors are adequately attained across the region. Longley assured that with the conclusion of the two-day conference, there will be clearer plans to address the issue. In a very real way, that when we talk about unemployment, when we talk about restructuring, it's not just figures on paper, but we, we we're going to see uh, today, and I think the visit is extremely timely, uh, the reality behind those figures, that when these changes are pushed through by companies, it has a very direct, a very sad, a very human impact. Brother Seapol has continued to raise this issue uh, in IUF governing bodies. We have the full support of the IUF Executive Committee, uh, and I think between us we will be able to make a very strong report uh, to the upcoming IUF Executive Committee this year to underline the importance of our work in the sugar sector and the importance of supporting this struggle going forward. After the day one conference, both the IUF and other union representatives visited the Scalden Estate and met with several redundant sugar workers. 
The International Union of Food, Agriculture, Hotel, Restaurants, Catering, Tobacco and Allied Workers Union is a global union federation of trade unions founded in 1920. In 2005, the IUF was composed of 336 member organizations in 120 countries, representing more than 12 million workers worldwide. Recently, the IUF held its 27th World Congress in Geneva on issues affecting young people in the workplace, members in the LGBTI community, occupational health and safety, among other important issues. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. A stall owner at Border Market is wondering if he has been targeted or if he has bad luck. The stall has been broken into twice for the year. Yanis Abrams tells of that individual. The Venger Sorgen, who owns stalls 103 and 104 in Border Market, is now counting his losses after bandits broke into his business and carted off with his items. This occurred sometime last night or in the wee hours of this morning. Sorgen mentioned that yesterday afternoon he stocked his stalls. However, this morning he was shocked to know that persons had burglarized his stalls. The guys them that is be patrolling, I can see it's in the morning or in the night. The place is quiet and they can hear like when these locks are being broken in. The store owner alleges that he was told that city constables were two stalls away. However, they claim they did not hear any noise in the market. Prior to the second, right, they had break-ins. I made reports. On the second of this year here, um, my st stall was broken into. I made a report, right, and... Um, the, the, the constables, they came, they, they took a report and stuff, and um, today is the 18th. Today, this morning, I came, the stand got broken into again, they, and uh, the constables seem to do, be doing nothing about it. This last encounter has made Sorgen lose $40,000. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. That's a wrap for MTV News Update's Week in Review. The newscast can be viewed online on MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us on Monday, January 22 at 7 hours 30 for another edition of MTV News Update. On behalf of our news and technical teams, I am Ashley Scotland thanking you for watching. Good night.